So again, uh, wonderful seeing you all here. Uh, road safety is something which is touching everyone's life every day, day in and day out. Like it or not, it's a part of our life. And uh, you know, it's not a choice, but a compulsory choice to make road safety a part of our lives. And uh, you know, if we don't do, what is the, uh, you know, why, why do we need to do that? A lot of people say that road safety is not our problem, road safety is the problem. Road safety has to be dealt with by the authorities, by the governments, by everybody other than me. Right? Road safety is my neighbor's problem, road safety is my society's problem, road safety is my municipality corporation problem, but not my problem. But end of the day, there are 450 plus people who don't reach back home every day. That's a reality. And that too, in a country which which perhaps has about 1 to 2 percent of the road network in the entire world and contributes to about 11 percent of the fatality uh, in the entire uh, in this uh, uh, in this world so 11 percent of the fatality with about 1 to 2 percent of road network is a you know is something that should shake us all uh, shake uh, you know all of us and uh, you know we all work hard day in and day out to end of the day go back home and you know, serve our family, make our family stronger, make our economy stronger. But if we lose our life in the process of doing so, what is the fun in uh, doing all the hard work that we do? So, you know, unfortunately, th these are the statistics which are real, which are reported. I'm sure all of you, should, all of you know that the reported numbers, the real numbers would be perhaps two or three times more than the reported numbers. But even if we go by the reported number, it's 450, almost 450 a day uh, death, almost uh, you know 12 to 1300 uh, a day injured, out of which 200 to 300 will be disabled. So these are the numbers which uh, you know almost 45 to 50 children die every day. I mean they don't die; we murder them. They don't die on their own. Small school children, and they all are killed on the road. It, it's it's happening on a daily basis. It is so much predictable that we know that by now, today, almost 350 people would have died. Tomorrow again, 450 plus will die. Yesterday, 450 died. And with each death, there are like four to five, six or seven people who are connected to every single individual uh, who, who, who does not uh, go back home uh, every day. So, and that's why I said that, uh, you know, road safety is no more a choice. It's a compuls compulsory choice to make. Uh, for all of us. Uh, in, in the country, if we see the statistics from 2019, 2020, 2021, of course in 2020 there was a slight dip and we all know the reason. Half of the uh, vehicles were, uh, you know, they did not even come out of the uh, apartments. I did not drive for more than six to seven months. I'm sure most of us didn't. And uh, in 2021 there is a huge jump, even from the base of 2019. So. We were used to saying dead lakh log marte and dead lakh log marte. It's about 150,000 plus minus 5,000 every year. But in 2021, we have crossed 1.7, 1.7 lakhs. So it's about 173,000 in, in uh, 2021. Why has this happened? In fact, if you see, number of incidents have come down, but number of fatalities have gone up significantly because the, uh, the severity rate is going up. So more accidents are getting converted into fatal. Uh, than before, and that is all because you know we are doing. Uh, there is a lot of progress in the area of infrastructure, in the area of uh, vehicle, but what is not getting better is the person inside the vehicle, and that is where I think uh, you know today's deliberation should be focused around. You know how do we make that individual? Because you know I see a lot of program. Uh, the government is also spending almost. You know there uh, out of these three elements of uh, road, vehicle, and the driver. I think a lot of work is happening in the area of road. Uh, we see beautiful roads coming up almost, uh, you know, on a daily basis, 34, 33 to 34 kilometers is being built. In terms of vehicle, the vehicle that we have driven uh, 20 years back, 10 years back, and today the vehicles have changed drastically. A lot of, uh, you know, vehicles are all tech enabled. Those days even the luxury vehicles were not uh, having that much of uh, technology. Today, even the base level vehicles are having airbags, uh, you know, uh, most of the technology which are there. But what is not changing is the person inside. And if we all believe, a lot of people say that road acha ho jayega, sarkar kya road acha ho jayega, to road safety theek ho jayega. 
but you all remember in October last year, we had a very, very unfortunate incident uh, on Purvanchal Highway, right? A beautiful road. I don't think uh, you can have a better road than the Purvanchal Highway that we have today, and a BMW car. So all of us agree that it's a safe car, right? So a BMW car, a luxury car, a Purvanchal uh, Highway, and four educated, learned people inside. One of them was a doctor, one engineer, and two others. And they were driving for fun, touched 300 kilometers per hour, and finally died. And they, they, they were all, uh, you know, this whole act of, uh, uh, you know, stupidity was being flashed on Facebook Live. Right? All of us, I think most of us would have seen this uh, video. So do you all think that a good road and good vehicle can all solve the problem? I don't think so. So good road, bad road, plus bad vehicle, and a good skilled driver with the right behaviors perhaps can avoid the incident. But a very good road and a very good uh, vehicle and an unskilled or a bad behavior driver is a disaster, will certainly be a disaster. And that is why I think uh, uh, you know our focus, uh, even in our company, uh, has been uh, on on looking at how do we skill the driver, how do we make their uh, you know behavior, how do we make intervention in their behavior, in their driving behavior, and for that you need technology. How do you know whether the driver is driving good or bad? Because until and unless there is an accident, we assume that the driver is good because there is no accident, right? So accident cannot be accident is accidental, right? It, it, it's not necessary that uh, you know, every time you jump a red signal uh, or traffic signal, you'll meet with an accident. And that is something that uh, you know, strengthens our wrong behavior because we feel that every time I'm jumping, I've been doing this for the last 10 years, I'm an expert in drink and drive. I, I, I never use helmet and uh, seat belt. But still, uh, you know, nothing has happened to me. So, uh, you know, why do I need to do so? And that's a false sense of security that uh, you know we all get. And that is why it's uh, it's important that we measure the driving behavior. Unless and until we measure, how do we improve? And that is what we adopted uh, in my previous organization, current organization. Baram is here. He has been uh, part of this journey. And uh, uh, you know, we started measuring. We got the numbers, we got to know which driver is good at you know, what kind of skill and, and needs some intervention in what kind of uh, uh, you know, driving skills, whether it is braking, speeding, whatever. And then if you make the right intervention at the right time, it has given us good results, it has given many other companies that I know of good results, and this is where I think corporates they can come together and, and make a huge difference because we put all the corporates and the vehicles that the corporates are uh, utilizing, whether in the area of uh, uh, you know, personal mobility or in the area of uh, uh, material movement, I think uh, it's a lot. And if the organizations, if some sort of uh, uh, regulatory bodies, they can regulate this, they can make it mandatory for certain things, I'm sure our uh, logistic community also will you know, join, the, um, you know, uh, join the movement and a lot can change thereafter. So this is where I think uh, you know, all of us can make, make a difference because Unfortunately, you know, while the roads and the vehicles are getting better, uh, the fatalities are going up. We see a lot of uh, incidents happening because of overspeeding, again because of the good vehicle, and because vehicle has the cap capability of going beyond 100, 120 easily. And every vehicle is sold. Uh, I think one of the USP is that you know it touches 100 kmph in five seconds. It touches you know 100 kmph in four and a half seconds. So that is one of the USP for all the car manufacturers. On the other side, you see, I remember one of the, I won't name, but one of the uh, two-wheeler uh, manufacturer, there was an advertisement some years back. I saw uh, the, the tagline was zip, zap, zoom, right? So you buy my bike, even if there is a traffic, you can zip, zap, zoom. And that is why you should buy my bike. And this was pulled down uh, after some, uh, you know, some activists, they uh, raised uh, this in the uh, appropriate forum. So I think uh, uh, you know it is important that uh, we all become uh, responsible. We we ensure that technology is used to our advantage. Uh, there is a lot of uh, problem that we have, and uh, we are failing as a society. We are failing as family. We are failing as corporates in adopting. So road safety is everybody's problem, but nobody is going to solve it. Every individual says that you know the other person will solve it. 
it all starts from the school age, it all starts from the family, and recently I was discussing with somebody and we felt, actually I'll give you an example, a couple of days back I, I went to drop my daughter to school, and a father with two children on his, uh, you know, uh, scooty, he was driving on the footpath, on, on the uh, wide footpath. Now what happens in the morning that all the children, when they see their friends, especially when they are on the, uh, you know, walkway, they run around, they go and meet their friends uh, uh, when they see them. And that is where a father with two children is driving on the uh, footpath, and he is an educated guy. I stopped him, I said, you know, what makes you drive on this uh, footpath? He said, you know, the, there was a traffic jam, Kya hua? What, what's the big deal, why, why are you making uh, this a big deal? I said, you are not just you are doing a mistake, but you are teaching two of your young children who are sitting on your bike that making such mistakes is normal, it is okay. So tomorrow, and, and I asked him to, okay, you go and drop your children, then come back, we'll have a discussion. And then I said, if, if unfortunately your children meet with an accident tomorrow, when they grow up, when they start uh, riding a bike, don't blame his friends, blame yourself. So we are used to saying, Are, kharab sangati mein bacha kharab ho gaya. It is not kharab sangati, but kharab father who has made that uh, child believe right since that is that doing this is okay. Couple of days back again, I saw a bike, a father is riding, a child, I think about 10 year old, was sitting behind, and he is holding the phone while the father has his helmet tilted, and the phone is here on his father's ear, and father is talking, okay? Now that child will grow up thinking that holding a phone, holding a phone while riding a bike is okay. I mean, it's normal. So in our society, we normalize wrong behavior very easily because most of us are doing it. And that is something that must change. And uh, so uh, it's a road safety again, uh, you know, is something which is multifaceted and it has multiple dimensions. And technology is certainly going to solve certain things, but not everything. I see, uh, and all of you must have seen the motor uh, driving schools. Uh, you know, just before this session we were talking. Motor driving school, the instructor is sitting next to you and the driver is, the learner is, uh, you know, on the driver's seat. And both the side view mirrors are folded. Why? Because this guy is learning and he might end up breaking those uh, side view mirrors. Now what kind of motor driving instructor that guy is? So where are the minimum parameters, and I'm looking up to Achilles also, I, to, to build such, uh, you know, such minimum parameters where motor driving instructor, because the person inside the vehicle will get better only if he is growing up better, only if that, that child, you know, looks at his parent as a responsible parent, as a responsible citizen. Then the child grows up, becomes, uh, you know, uh, attains the age of 18, he gets into a motor driving school, he gets the right instructor. How do I know who are the right instructors? So I think there should be a forum. There should be some sort of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, website or something which gives us the right information that these are the people who are, who are authorized to uh, train you, not anybody and everybody who, because motor driving is not just about holding the steering and, and making sure you drive the vehicle straight. It is about learning how to brake. It is about learning how to turn. It is about a lot of other things than just just driving and riding. So, so these sort of uh, uh, you know, changes are required and I think technology can play a huge role in everything uh, that we are doing. But end of the day, the, the, someone has to make sure that the side view mirrors are not folded. That technology cannot solve, right? With the best of the technology, if the side view mirrors are folded, if the uh, you know, rear view mirror is uh, you know, used for makeup rather than looking uh, uh, you know, what is behind, if the rear windshield is used for billboard, for advertisement, you know, God save us. Uh, I think those things, only society, uh, and, and I, I firmly believe that, you know, all of us take a cue from uh, what happened in COVID. We started asking each other, you know, where is your mask? We get into a lift and uh, we see somebody who is not masked, either we don't get in or we ask the person to, you know, put on his mask. I think in road safety, this is what is required. The social upliftment, the society has to become aware and we have to ask Roko and Toko, we have to ask each other. And, and I think we have to go one level beyond Roko and Toko and, 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 and uh, after Roko, Toko, if that doesn't work, then, and then Toko. I think it is also important, right? So because if you Toko, then you are actually saving that person's life, right? 
So, uh, Thoko is not physically Thoko. You can ask the authorities to Thoko or Chalan, right? So, because it's getting recorded. <laughs> so, so, that's all from my side. I think, uh, you know, uh, long way to go. Uh, but good to see such forums are happening. Uh, uh, corporates are playing, a lot of responsible corporates are playing a good role. Uh, our media, our, uh, uh, you know, Bollywood, film industry, cinema, they also have to join the bandwagon. I think uh, responsible influencing is something which is very important. Today I see Bollywood and cinema is irresponsibly uh, influencing because our heroes are the hero who can fly. And heroes are the hero who can actually take their bike and fly. So these are something that uh, are influencing a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 18-year-old, uh, you know, teenager. And, the, uh, and we talked before about the wrong influencing by the parents also. So one side is society, one side is government, uh, regulatory bodies, and corporate, of course, is playing their role. But uh, technology has to be adopted, AI, ML, and there are a lot of technology every day. New technology is coming up. Uh, we have uh, actually to give you a number before I end. Uh, in fact, in my current organization, and uh, you know, not to be quoted anywhere, uh, we had when we realized that a uh, lot of uh, incidents are happening outside, uh, outside our, of our controlled boundary on the road, we realized that the number was very high, number of fatality in 2016. And thereafter, we made some interventions using technology. And today, I'm proud to say that in 2020, 2021, 2021 and 2022, we have recorded zero fatality uh, in spite of having 100,000 trucks which are working for us. So th this is the benefit. This is the benefit that uh, uh, technology, uh, you know, like uh, AI, ML, uh, Dashcam, all these things can uh, give to all of us. It is unbelievable when we start, and we also did not believe it. But five years down the line, I'm proudly standing here and sharing this story with you. So thank you very much. I wish uh, 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 the organizers and everybody all the best. And uh, I am sure we will be much wiser two hours later uh, after the deliberations. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. So very good evening to all of you. And uh, thank you, E.T. and Netradine for organizing this session. We had a very good panel from varied uh, you know, field and expertise. Uh, we, we have Mr. Bala Subramaniam from uh, Bala, Bala Sundaram, right? Bala, so yeah. Bala, I will call him Bala. So we have him from the Insurance Association. We have C.V. Kumar, who is into transportation and distribution. We have uh, Ravi Nair, who is from Reliance, and he's also into logistics, uh, about more than, I think, 15, 20 years into the logistic field. And uh, we have Bairam Dala, who is also into transportation with about, uh, looking at his age, doesn't look that way, but his company is 50 years old. Yeah. So, so we, will, we will deliberate on this theme, uh, the road safety, and how to mobility, how, how technology can influence safer mobility. So, so in, my, in the, the earlier speaker, the keynote address, he said that there were a lot of accidents in India, and uh, about one and a half lakh accidents, 450 accidents, and uh, the experience from being in the you know, transport or the distribution industry uh, is that just giving, uh, the, uh, just giving the driver training, counseling does not help. It has to be integrated with technology where the technology can systematically alert the driver. So, so that's, that's our discussion for today. And I will ask my first question to Ravi, who has been in long years into the logistic uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, uh, Ravi, based on your long years of experience in logistics, to what extent your company reliance uh, integrated technology such as cameras or artificial in uh, intelligence, uh, maybe even GPS, and uh, which help the drivers, and whether in integrating these technologies has it really reduced your accidents? Thanks, Alvin. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks to ET and Netherdine for this forum and uh, bringing us together. Uh, to respond to your question, Alvin, uh, yes, we have been working on various technologies uh, 
and as Reliance, uh, and also in my previous organizations where I was in charge of the safety as well as the logistics portfolio. Uh, we have been experimenting with various technologies that are provided and available. Uh, specifically talk of uh, ADAS, and uh, which is the in-cap monitoring system what we have. Uh, yes, we are still in a pilot stage. We are on a P doing a POC to see which is the best technology and which is the best, best man uh, OEM who we can partner with. Again, it's a risk-based approach we are taking because it doesn't make uh, sense to gold plate the uh, logistics because ultimately we need to be competitive also. GPS is something which we have been working on for last, uh, at least in talk of Reliance experience, last almost seven, eight years. It has really given us a lot of benefits. However, I would just want to put a different perspective. It is not just about employing technology. Technology will throw a lot of data onto us. Like if you install a GPS solution in any of your fleet, the number of exceptions that come, I can talk of my own example. When I started with this GPS journey seven years ago, and we also equally set up a control through mechanism where we can do an exception monitoring. Where without an exception monitoring, GPS per se is of no use. It will just give you data. And generally, if you see the industry, people are just using it for ETA compliance, or maybe at the most, an EB, EBA bill compliance, which is the latest thing which people do for. But especially when you're from a safety perspective, unless you build, back it up with a suitable exception monitoring and a real-time intervention mechanism, it is not really going to help you. So that was my experience. And when we began this journey, even with one violation, we used to get something like uh, 70, 80 violations every day. The control room guys were going just mad. How to handle it? But then slowly, slowly with timely intervention, building up the ecosystem, ensuring that the vendors also come on speed with our requirement, getting the capacity building of the vendors done. That's equally important. That's how you start getting the results. And then today, I'm at a such a stage with more than 11 violations being monitored. For our Haskem movement, we are getting violations in single digit. That's the journey we have achieved. But it is, technology is definitely an enabler. Without technology, you can't proceed. But you need to back it up with suitable uh, ecosystem, which is like control room monitoring, which I talked about. And specifically talk of camera. Yes, it is a very good thing. It can, uh, one of the biggest challenge today is modern day driving is uh, uh, distracted driving, which is usage of mobile phone. And uh, perhaps this is the only technology which can actually help us curb that. And this is a problem which the, even the developed world is facing. So uh, it, it's a matter of time when government makes it mandatory that AI and uh, this thing is mandatory, at least for the Haskem and those critical movements, this will see a big boom. Also in case of accident investigation, this gives you a lot of inputs. Because uh, that gives up, uh, the overall incident investigation gets eased out when you have a camera in place. So I would like to leave it at that stage. Yeah, thanks Ravi for these inputs and surely the uh, cameras are you know, helpful in investigation because uh, every time if you have an accident, the driver will say, oh, samne wale ka galti hai. And uh, the other way around also it's good if it is not the driver's mistake and if it is some pedestrian mistake or some other this, that also is captured on camera. I have one more question. I'll not leave you so soon. Uh, how do you think policy makers, regulators can ensure that road safety education becomes an essential part of all driver trainings? Because now we find that, you know, uh, driver training institutes, they themselves don't have the safety. If they have closed the two side mirrors, I mean, what kind of uh, teaching they are doing, yeah? So, so what's your thought on that? That's a very uh, difficult question and a very interesting one also. As uh, Pankaj said, the way that driving is taught in this country, where the instructor actually uh, folds the mirrors and then he, he, because he doesn't want to safeguard his vehicle from this being hit. I think what we teach on our drivers when we get into driving school is only the basic, I'll say the, techno, the, I'll say the mechanism of driving. 
because we generally are on manual cars still. So just a question of uh, how to release the clutch, how to give the accelerator, be, get the steering control, that's what we, we, we teach. There is no emphasis on uh, a theory session. There are few driving schools like Maruti who does that, where there we also have simulators. Otherwise, by and large, most of the driving schools uh, which operate in this country, where they have an instructor who has no clue about the, the, the mechanics of driving, he just know how to control the car and then shift the gears and then he just drive, it makes you a driver. And we all know how the tests are conducted in our country. There has been some changes, but then yes, we still a long way to go. Some of the states are really doing well. I can quote uh, Gujarat per se, where I think the, the standards of uh, driving tests are really good. They actually make you drive on a test track and then uh, some of the very difficult ones uh, uh, task are being asked to perform. It's a very good thing. I think more, all states should really uh, go for that. What I feel is, uh, along with the driving, what is more important is the defensive driving. Especially in our uh, country, where uh, we just can't assume that the process will work. Uh, we can't assume that if there is a uh, free left turn, that no one cross or no one will come from the other side. So we need to be a little more cautious. So when we drive on the Indian roads, the basic mantra is expect the unexpected. If you just build that mindset, you can be a safer driver. And that is what defensive driving is going to teach you. So uh, driver training, along with an emphasis on defensive driving, which is not taught in any of the schools, like in our own organization, in some of the organizations which I have worked for, Defensive driving was a mandatory requirement. Like all my, my sales colleagues, or as even supply chain colleagues, uh, we were not authorized to be on office business unless I am rated certain grade based on my defensive driving score. That is the level of uh, involvement required. There are, I can talk of some companies where control rooms are being used to monitor the movement of their sales teams for exception violation. Because these are the basics of defensive driving. And unless you get the mindset of defensive driving training, uh, defensive driving, the driving safety cannot come in. So I think uh, Ravi made a very good point. You know, driving training you can get, but defensive driving, there are many organizations which have defensive driving for their employees, like similar to what Ravi did. We also, unless we passed, we were not supposed to use our uh, you know vehicles if we if you use our vehicle we could be sacked but unfortunately there are many who don't have this facility in their size so so my take would be that we should have the regulators put in a defensive driving program as part of the you know uh, yes. licensing I, procedure exactly yeah, and so i think everybody gets it even the passenger cars the private car owners can get that defensive driving program sure and i think in fact it should be also made mandatory that a refresher like uh, yes Maybe once in three years, five years, that duration we can debate and discuss. But then ultimately, uh, you need to have a refresher course also. Sure. sure. Thanks, thanks, Ravi. Now, I will now go to Mr. Bairam Dala. Uh, Bairam, as he's there 50 years into transportation uh, business, Bairam, we said that we, uh, artificial intelligence and all will work and this will reduce accidents. But as a transporter, as a logistic service provider, how optimistic are you about the technologies such as these cameras, radars, for commercial vehicles, which can assist the drivers and make driving smarter as well as safer? And these are available, but what are the challenges of implementing these technologies in commercial vehicles? Because there are lots of them. You know, each person has a what about fleet of uh, uh, range from 20 to 500 vehicles. So how, how difficult is it or how easy is it? Uh, Thanks, Alvin, and thanks, ET and Netradine for having me here. I'd like to backtrack to what Ravi was touching on earlier, and I think the core of the problem is education, lack of education to drivers. I mean, we're talking about driving schools, but the driving schools do not educate the drivers. They facilitate the license, however harsh that may sound in this forum. And that's a reality. I see it all the time. We employ drivers, and we constantly onboarding drivers, and I interact with them because that's something I'm passionate about. 
um, understanding what their background is, where they come from, and what sort of training they have, and it's shocking, to say the least. Um, many of them have driving licenses which are several years old and don't know the basics. We are privileged that we have worked with companies such as um, companies like um, Care for Safe Driving, so we do have a fairly large um, database of knowledge on that. So I think it's, I mean, I was just trying to cap, recap in my mind just now while I was listening to Ravi speak about what are the four or five main things that hurt our safety numbers on the roads. And I'd say education is one. Number two, and this is the reality of our country, unfortunately, is discipline, complete lack of discipline. Even if you have the education, you choose not to use it. I lost a dear friend on the 4th of September because he wasn't wearing a seat belt in the rear seat of his car, of the car he was traveling in. Um, and he doesn't like, edu he did not like education. He was certainly a very much more enlightened person than I am, but he probably didn't have the personal discipline at that time and it cost him his life. Um, the third is enforcement. So you may have the education, you may lack the discipline, but you do not, it, it's not enforced. It's not adequately uh, driven on the highways. Now it seems to have swung the other way, and I'm speaking in, in uh, relation to commercial vehicles on the road. We're getting ridiculous fines for very, very frivolous, um, apparently very frivolous offenses. It's also being to a small extent misused. We are seeing fines for trucks that are not in a particular state on that, at that time on, and that day. And equipment like um, GPS, our cameras are helping us to establish um, where we were physically at or where that vehicle physically was at. The fourth, finger, the fourth is infrastructure. I'm critical about the way our roads are being built, putting down what looks like smooth tarmac with, I, I, I mean, I'm saying this in all humility because I've driven across many, many continents of the world. It's a passion for me. Uh, we lack engineering on our roads. So putting down a smooth road does not make for a good road. Engineering is very, very critical. We did an analysis of the last three incidents we had in our business, and all of them involved hitting medians or road dividers, as they're called built of concrete, similar to the one that um, Mr. Mystery, uh, the car that Mr. Mystery was in um, uh, uh, faced on that highway. So we lack engineering. There's all sorts of challenges that happen on our highways, okay? People moving in the wrong direction, slow moving traffic, um, you know, other than our controlled ac access roads, which are now slowly developing into a larger number of the, the kilometers that are being put down, the Bombay Nagpur Highway being one, Bombay Pune, uh, in Ahmedabad, um, Baroda, and such roads. Um, I still am critical about the fact that we are building lots of roads, but the engineering is poor, and that's why it's hurting the safety numbers. And of course, then the number five is coming to technology. I'm very, very sold on the whole um, technology coming into managing road safety for sure. Um, I gather from my conversations with the Netradyne team that we are among the earlier users of their uh, solutions. While it does show us what's going wrong, I'm optimistic that technology will be able to manage what's going wrong. Um, we're using one of the most premium brand trucks in, in the world currently for some of our applications, um, Volvo trucks. And uh, I've been pushing the Volvo team very, very hard to bring in all the tech on road safety that they have globally. And they often say that, is this, is this country ready for it? And I say, yeah, I don't know about the country, but we are certainly ready for it. So you should leave that decision to users like us. Um, AI-enabled cameras, we're using these cameras. We are seeing some interesting stuff. We are seeing some really scary stuff. I'm seeing it on our own trucks. Um, I believe there's a clip from one of my own trucks which happened an incident that took place last week where a driver was asleep for a good 40 or 50 seconds and cruising at 60 kilometers an hour on the Hyderabad ring road. 
Of course, we did counsel him significantly the next day. We called him in and we talked to him, we showed it to him without belittling him because he didn't know better. He didn't know that he should have stopped the journey and handed over to the other driver. Many of our businesses are time bound and we do not have the luxury of being able to keep them off the road for um, eight hours or 10 hours for rest outside of the truck. So we're trying to manage it within the ecosystem that's available right now. But for sure, there are things like adaptive braking, um, you know, things that manage lane shift. So a driver dozing off at the wheel and straying into another lane will auto-correct. These technologies are there, and they do not cost an arm and a leg. They're quite affordable in the overall scheme of things when you balance against the cost of an accident, a loss of life. As one saying always goes, you will never know the, lives, the number of lives you saved on the road. You will hear about the ones that the people, the people who lost their lives on the road. But safer driving will save you lives on the road. So I'm, I'm optimistic that these solutions are moving in the right direction when they integrate these sort of alert. Basically, these uh, devices give us alerts, but they don't correct. They're not in a position to correct. But I think when the two integrate, a truck will probably be able to stop when it notices that a driver has actually fallen asleep for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, it'll bring him to a stop and maybe switch on hazard lights or you know, alert him in some other way. So to sum it up, yes, I'm a big fan of this whole uh, d direction that we are all taking and I do believe that it's going to change. It'll hopefully change the way uh, trucks are being driven. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bayram, for that. Uh, the, my next question to you is, yes, uh, you said that the the cost is uh, not much, but whenever we try to implement technology, and since this technology is newer in India, so it comes at a cost. So as a transporter, how would you, you know, analyze your cost-benefit analysis and what would be your benefits which you will consider, uh, you know, implementing this, the cost and the benefits what you would consider to put in this cost of technology to your entire fleet. So if you have a fleet of 10, it's still okay. But if you have a fleet of 500, then how do you, you know, do that cost-benefit analysis? I'd say the 500 makes it easier, not harder. And um, I think the cost-benefit analysis is a very clear equation about what it costs to have the incident, all the, all the pains that come with it. Sadly, the way incidents are handled in this country is, is extremely stressful for most transporters. Sorry, I'm speaking in relation to myself being a transporter and not about private cars. Of course, even in the case of private cars, it can be a very, very difficult journey once you have a serious incident, as we are seeing just now, uh, in the same case I was speaking of earlier. Uh, but uh, the cost of an incident is huge, and it, it doesn't take too much for us to quantify uh, that cost. And in relation to which, of course, we will push suppliers to improve their cost numbers and to value engineer it downwards, especially as numbers go up, without doubt. But I don't think personally that that is a question when you're buying a truck worth several lakhs or rupees. It's, it should become a non-negotiable, like buying a set of tires. You cannot avoid changing your tires. You cannot avoid changing your clutch. You'll have to do it, other the trucks are not going to move. Just as they've mandated that a truck has to adhere to uh, Bharat State 6 norms for emissions, they should start moving in the direction of adding this on. They've added something called AIS 140, which is the GPS device on these trucks, which I'm not clear what role it's currently playing. I mean, they're tracking and tracing trucks, or they're building up a database probably. Maybe they'll use it for management of tolls as things, go, as things move forward. But bringing in this tech should not, uh, the cost should not be a deterrent to making business safer. Because I think many of us, are, many of my colleagues in the industry do not recognize or acknowledge the cost of um, of an incident. Yeah, I would I would agree with you because they say that you know if you want you don't want to spend on safety, try having an accident. Yeah, so then you will understand what cost benefit analysis is there. So I will go to my next panelist, uh, Mr. C V Kumar. Uh, he's the CEO of CCI Logistics, and they specialize into customized transport solutions, including last mile delivery secondary distribution and logistic management in less than truckload, LCL cargo. So, Mr. Kumar, my question to you is that the last mile deliveries are always rush deliveries because all the efficiencies in the supply chain is put on the last mile and that driver has to deliver, yeah, because 
uh, whatever delays have happened, the last person has to deliver that. So how do you balance between safe delivery and speedy delivery? And especially when we find that the, the number one reason for the accidents is speed. valid question yeah. yeah so thank you for a very very valid question but not all last minute deliveries necessarily mean reckless driving it is quick commerce which requires very fast deliveries rest of the last mile deliveries does not always uh, require to be you know rushed through of course there will be a little bit of delays here and there and customers as well as buyers or receivers generally understand that uh, uh, very well. Uh, quick commerce, of course, you know, right from the days when, you know, pizza delivery happens, like uh, when we say, if the pizza is not hot, you don't have to pay. So right from those days and to uh, just deliver it within a blink of an eye or instantaneously, uh, definitely has got this risk involved in uh, what you call irresponsible unsafe driving the same but thankfully they are a very small portion of the entire last mile delivery ecosystem number one and number two you will find the last mile delivery players having larger number of dark stores uh, where the deliveries really happen so it is not exactly that you know people are driving uh, hell well uh, to deliver within some fixed prices the you know, fixed time timelines and as I said earlier, 90% uh, of the last day deliveries does not require that kind of this thing. So I do not subscribe to the view that, you know, last mile deliveries do increase the, this thing. But there is one uh, behavioral factor which we need to look at, you know. The people involved in deliveries are typically very, very young people with very little, uh, what you call, mental maturity. And these are the people who generally tend to drive recklessly, uh, trying to dodge red lights, uh, trying to, you know, weave in and weave out of the traffic, so, which causes uh, some of the accidents. So, this is also one factor which we need to look into. Uh, apart from education, is to, have you made him uh, mature enough to understand the results of his action, uh, how he drives? So, that's also one more thing which you see. Uh, Ravi was mentioning that, you know, along with technology intervention is required. Uh, Bairam was talking about, uh, you know, how uh, uh, aware people have become because of the technology. But my point is that, you know, along with that, you know, the mental maturity, the emotional maturity which needs to be there, that's missing. That's missing in the training uh, during classroom zooms or anything. And I think as a society, we do not give that training. And that's some one area where we need to uh, work really hard and maybe more uh, to ensure that, you know, that does not happen. Uh, accidents do not happen because of that. So, last mile delivery is not dangerous. Not always. So, so <laughs> good to hear that the last mile delivery is not always dangerous. But yes, speed is one of the major uh, accidents, causes of accidents. And if you see Zomato or Pizza guys, the delivery within so many minutes, and they, they can come out from anywhere and go from whichever side. So, so that, that very well said by at least three panelists that defensive driving, it all boxed down to defensive driving. So be it a scooter or be it a bike or a four-wheeler, uh, accidents can happen on any mobile mobility vehicle. So we need to have that defensive driving, you know, to push into the too. system by itself, yeah. And uh, uh, second question to you is to what degree do you believe that newer technologies uh, with alerts can help driver efficiency and safety when it comes to the last mile delivery. So safety as well as efficiency. Uh, there are two things which does, you know, see uh, some of the uh, technologies we have in route, or route optimization today uh, can, you know, avoid empty returns, empty runs, uh, which is definitely one of the best things. Uh, I don't see any of the last mile delivery guys really watching their team members uh, driving or driving safely or not, none, none does. There is no control room for them. Uh, they are just uncontrolled bunch of people, you know, who are going there, unfortunately. Uh, but one thing which can happen really is that, you know, uh, there can be a mobile app where, you know, the uh, driver, the deliverer can be warned, like 
we have this ADAS system where we know driver gets automatic warning. So that exception management can be brought in in that uh, mobile app as it is. Uh, something which is missed right now in the technology industry and that's something which can be looked at. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, the only thing which I think which is more important more than technology is the training which needs to be given to the person as to the importance of his life and the life of other road users. And that particular portion, however much we talk about defensive driving, which you and I do day in and day out, uh, we need to talk about that maturity. And uh, we have something called pre-departure counseling for our drivers, uh, both for own vehicles as well as for market vehicles. So it's in multiple languages developed by my organization. So what we do in that pre-departure counsel is that the first sentence we say is that your life is important. The driver is not bothered about anything else, but you know the speed of delivery, faster reward system. So we say that you have a family waiting for you. Think about that. So it's that emotional pull that needs to be uh, taught to this last mile delivery personnel, which is missing, unfortunately. And you know maybe all of us together can you know uh, fill in that missing link to make it a very safe uh, practice. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Kumar. You put a very good point that the last mile delivery guys are all not monitored. They don't get any training, so we must look at that. <clears throat> I come to Mr. Bala now. So he's from the <clears throat> Insurance Brokers Association. And <clears throat> as part of the industry, Mr. Bala, uh, and based on your experience, what is the one or two main reasons of motor accidents which you feel when the claims are coming in yeah. and what are the reasons on which accident claims can be rejected especially if they are related to the driver or driver behavior or driver not having training thank you very much for the question Alvin and uh, pleasure to be here among all of you thanks to ET and Netradine to voice my opinion about road accidents from the insurance standpoint. The first question you asked me was about the major causes of accidents from my experience. I narrated in two ways. Typically the claim form would say, as I was driving at 50 kilometers per hour, a cow suddenly crossed the road, I applied brakes, but the vehicle swerved and hit a tree, or it hit a divider. And when it comes to a police report, the FIR always says it is section 279, rash and negligent driving. So what exactly is the cause of the accident? To put it very simply, I would say human beings, or it is man-made. And that does not equate to rash and negligent driving also, as I would like to explain now. The human being has different components there. One, yes, perhaps he was rash in driving, careless. Second thing, could be human fatigue. In the pre-dawn hours he was driving after elaborate duty, he dozed off for a minute and the vehicle swerved off. Secondly, human fitness. I had a very interesting case here when I was an insurer, an underwriter, as part of our loss control programs. We said, uh, let us do an eye testing camp for one of our large corporate clients who receives at least 100 trucks a day. So we had doctors there sitting, just testing the drivers. Startling results, 45% of the drivers needed to have eye correction with glasses. So this was really startling. So this is the third point. Then there is another point which I talk about human bravado or overconfidence. Kuch nahi hone wala, chalate yaar. 95% of the times it doesn't happen. Chalta. Last but not the least, and here we are not talking about large logistics providers or large industries who are present in this room. We are talking about single truck operators, small operators, who, the unorganized sector who form the greater mass in the country. The last one, human greed, I would say. Like overloading the vehicle, <coughs> or using an underpowered vehicle, 15 ton ka cargo at 10 ton, 10 ton capacity chal jata hai. 99% of the cases it does. But where I insured it, it meets with a loss. And when you move over-dimensional cargo, a critical cargo, which needs to be handled with care, the lashing is not done properly because it involves an extra cost. 
it's a question of penny wise and pound foolish. So what comes out on paper as cause of loss and what really happens behind it are totally different. And not all losses could be attributed to the driver's behavior or rash and negligent driving. Now coming to the next point which you asked me is what is the defense which an insurance company has to deny a claim? Uh, I'll answer it in two parts. Whenever there is an accident, there are two components as all of you know. One is damage to the vehicle itself, which is the own damage, and the other is the third party liability which you incur towards death or grievous injuries to any third party or third party property damage also. Whatever be the policy conditions, talk about third party liabilities first. An insurance company has no defense. Let me put it very bluntly, there is no defense because the third party rules or the Motor Vehicle Act is primarily a welfare legislation. It goes in favor of the victim. So on paper, there is a defense that if the driver did not have a valid driving license, you can deny the claim. Yes, it happens in a few cases, but there are court judgments which say, what if the driver does not have a driving license? The victim is not aware of that, so you jolly well pay the claim. Or some courts have awarded saying that, pay first and recover from the owner later. But the victim should not be deprived of his compensation. Next issue is, one is about this uh, third party liability where we say, other thing is, another ground on which possibly a denial can take place is, if it can be established that he was under the influence of liquor. Again, very difficult to prove. Again, the benefit of doubt goes to the victim. Okay. Fault or no fault. Regulations say there is a no fault liability also. So even if the driver was not at fault or everything was fine, for a death you have to pay 50,000 and for a grievous injury you have to pay 25,000. Okay, forget it, a victim on the road, knocked down by a truck and we have not even know what truck it is or was it a private car, whatever it is, we don't know. Hit and run cases. Still there is a solatium fund which is contributed by the insurers which compensates the victim. So, as far as third party claims are concerned, no real defense for the insurer. Coming to the own damage portion of it, yes, there, there are defenses, like if the driving license is not valid, definitely the insurer is going to say no to the claim or come towards a sort of a negotiated settlement, whatever. Or if you feel that the vehicle has been overstretched, overloaded, whatever, again, there could be a negotiated settlement or a declination. Drunken driving, again, there could be a declination. But as far as third party liabilities go, I'm sorry, insurers are at the mercy. They have to pay up. Thanks, 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 Mr. Bala, for your elaborate this. And I'm sure many of the logistic service providers will now, now ensure that they are, you know, they take care to over, oversee all these, you know, negative things which can come in the way of their claims. My second question to you is: we discussed about you know the technology, the cost of technology. Uh, implementing technology will reduce accidents. But the overall, this is, if I have to put in this money, what do I get back? So of course, one side you are reducing the accidents. So in those terms, if you reduce accidents, of course the insurer benefits. So does implementing these, these uh, uh, initiatives or training drivers as an initiative, will it bring down the premium? Like in a warehouse, if I put up a warehouse, I have a fire system, I have a sprinkler system, the insurance premium goes down. So the, is there something like this which, which will be of help to the, to the industry? Okay. Uh, as of now, some insurers have taken some baby steps into telematics, trying to monitor driver behavior and see how premiums could be moderated basis the driving behavior, but then it should be over an extended period. And there should be a proof of the concept that because he drove well, he did not have accidents. So it would take a bit of a time. And if there are no accidents, naturally you get a no claim discount on your OD portion of the premiums per se. That's like a good marketer. Okay. So secondly, uh, I would deviate a little. Where technology comes in and you could derive a benefit, 
is not in case of the motor vehicle insurance, but possibly in case of marine cargo insurance. Where? Now, more, many insurers, I would say they would insist that if a particular type of cargo is being carried, you need to have the GPS monitoring, you need to have the truck monitored at every stage, and we have done this for some jewelry clients, and you see that once a guy was sitting, eating at a stall, roadside stall, somebody started the vehicle. And immediately there was a beep and alert which went to the driver and they were able to stop it. So it's not directly related to road accidents, but technology plays a much larger role as far as hijacking, thefts, pilferage, and non-deliveries are concerned, and which is already being implemented. And uh, especially for very large clients, I have seen that the premium does go down when they implement these measures. And as part of the loss control measures or loss minimization measures, insurers themselves offer these services, like they tie up with some GPS operators and ensure that it's installed on these trucks. So, so may not be directly on the motor premium as such as of now, primarily because it needs to have an extended run to prove the concept. But in case of marine cargo insurance, it has already started and some of the cargoes are not even written. No insurer would accept the risk unless you have these basic technicals in place. Thanks. Thanks for the very you know, detailed explanation. And I'm sure our audience also has got, uh, as the speaker said, they have got wiser uh, from this panel discussion. Um, so, you know, as per protocol, we'll have a few branding slides, but we'll run through them very quickly and we'll probably try and get to the matter and try and discuss some of it. I've covered some of the interesting points that uh, I thought were discussed uh, by the keynote speaker and the panelists as well, and I'll try and see if, you know, some of them can be addressed as well. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next one, please. Uh, so, uh, Writer Corporation has been in business since 1953. We are in multifaceted businesses, uh, mostly built around logistics, warehousing, and uh, off late into reality and hospitality. Uh, mostly into niche spaces, you know, uh, starting with relocations, where of course we do a lot of logistics. Uh, IMS, which does a lot of warehousing, and of course movement as well, and then uh, the cash logistics business, which uh, I take care of, and then we've got the Reality space, which sort of uh, looks into uh, building commercial and retail spaces, as well as uh, building warehouses and uh, five-star resorts. Uh, yeah. Uh, so primarily in our business, uh, we move the most lucrative thing. Uh, we move cash. Um, and it's important for us to have uh, safe mobility of this, because any accidents uh, not just risk uh, the vehicle and the lives, but also the cash that's in the vehicle. Uh, primarily, we've got about 1,600 owned vehicles that are running on the roads. Um, so, uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, uh, what we talked about in this forum, uh, primarily 94% of the accidents uh, happen due to uh, human error, right? And a lot of it is around speeding, but is also around uh, maneuvering uh, how the drivers maneuver the vehicles on the road. Um, uh, we were also talking about uh, you know, the cost of technology and the returns around it. Um, I think nothing is more expensive than a human life, and that's the first thing that we risk, right, as uh, uh, if accidents happen. So uh, I think that's of paramount importance, but then you've also got uh, issues around vehicles going off-road, your insurance premiums going up, and of course, uh, the cost of repairing these vehicles. So when we thought about all of this, um, we believed that, you know, um, and a lot of panelists talked about it, is the fact that uh, safer mobility is not just around technology, uh, but it's a lot around the culture and the behavioral shift. Uh, and how do you bring about cultural and behavioral shift? Is technology only going to do it? Uh, so you've got to build around uh, monitoring. You've got to build around enforcement. And again, you know, some of the panelists talked about the enforcement. Um, so we wanted to implement a technology uh, which is not just 
trying to monitor, but is also um, a way in which you know this technology could be used to educate the drivers, to bring in a cultural and behavioral shift, and also to ensure that there is real-time enforcement. Um, so these were the primary thoughts around which we were looking at a technology solution. Uh, we can move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, so while you know we were thinking of addressing this, uh, we said uh, if we've got to show the investors that there is a return on investment, what else can you build around it? Interestingly enough, our industry was going through a regulatory change uh, where we were getting uh, under the regulatory guidelines of both Ministry of Home Affairs as well as RBI. Uh, so we said, you know, it's an interesting thing that we could actually use uh, technology to address some of the regulatory requirements as well as look at how we could uh, control any pilferages of cash from the vans and also look at how we address the behavioral aspects within the van. Uh, yeah, so uh, we looked at uh, the Netradyne device and, uh, you know, um, one of the interesting thing is that, of course, you know, like every other mobility device, it helps your fleet managers to uh, manage your fleet well. You are able to have a real-time visibility of what's uh, happening in the vehicle. But what was more interesting was also the fact that we could use these devices uh, so to bring in regulatory control uh, within all our moving vehicles in terms of how the cash was being dealt with, uh, the security aspects of moving the cash, um, so that you know we were addressing all the regulatory requirements of each of the states uh, in terms of the police department, because MHA is, is the police department, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, once we've started sort of implementing and, you know, while uh, a lot of uh, the panelists here talked about and they were very interesting numbers to look at, we are probably early into this game and uh, we'll get into uh, probably where Reliance and Adanis are, where, you know, your numbers run into single digits. But I'll show you some actual numbers and actual videos um, uh, of where we are and, you know, what's really happening on ground. Um, but yeah, um, so you know, interestingly enough, this was one device which was helping us not just look at inside, but also in terms of external safety. Uh, it also helped us capture the real-time video, use them to educate our drivers, bring in a cultural and behavioral shift. Uh, sorry. Can we just go back? Can we go back to a slide, please? Uh, and of course, you know, um, our vehicles are driven by IoT and sensors and all of that. But then this was one device which was addressing most of the uh, requirements that we had. I've got a couple of videos and, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't, I would have loved to show what's inside because it's a cash van, so we are regulated. I can't show you what's inside it. But I can show you the external videos. and. Um, uh, you know, this device is really, really interesting. So, you know, apart from the drivers dozing off and their behavior, uh, it has got a very interesting concept of green zone. And these two videos really showcase every time that the driver goes out of that green zone, the kind of risk that it runs. Yeah, yeah so uh, keep a watch on the timeline uh, and the event happening. There, it goes out of the green zone. Right. Uh, we can go to the next one. Next one. This is not the next one. Yeah. This one is mostly in the green zone. There is just one blip, right? There's just one blip. Uh, which is outside the green zone. Um, so yeah, you know, so uh, of course some of these videos are scary and, and uh, uh, we've also had situations where 
we could avert because of this uh, many other incidents from happening. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, as we implemented these devices, the phase one success that we saw uh, was, you know, the near miss incidents, the events of uh, thefts, a lot of these things coming down significantly, and I'll show you them, uh, show it to you uh, in terms of actual numbers. Um, we've had the driver scores and the behavior in terms of how the driver's behaviors have changed, and again, you will see that in terms of the scores. And of course, uh, you know, uh, these devices have not just helped us manage our fleet, but we've been able to avert uh, some of the big theft attempts. And even when, uh, in a case when it was successful in terms of a heist, we were able to recover the cash and the vehicle. Uh, so yeah, we can move to the next one. Yeah, so we saw as we implemented a 38% reduction in the distracted driving, a 74% reduction in the driver drowsiness, right? So these were the immediate gains that we saw as we implemented. Go to the next one. Uh, these are some of the slides in terms of you know how uh, things folded uh, over the next four to five months. And if you see all the graphs, ra right from hard acceleration to hard braking, uh, people going out of the green zone in terms of their driving, uh, distance in terms of following vehicles, all of these uh, events have significantly come down. So, and all of these numbers are in double digits. So, uh, yeah, we are only getting there and probably will will be there soon as well. Um, this is the green zone driving score, and you can see that you know, uh, over the months there's been a consistent improvement, and uh, you know, all our drivers currently are upwards of 800, which is considered uh, a very safe sort of driving zone uh, so that's uh, that's something that that we are seeing happening uh, you know through the months um, and these are numbers which are speaking for themselves uh, the last one is probably the best uh, because that's really uh, the outcome of all of this yeah so if you see from May to June what has happened in terms of the real events happening uh, there's a drop from of about um, more than 50%, right? We've seen almost a 60% reduction in events happening. And that's been the real gain, right? So uh, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, we talk a lot about, um, you know, the driver behavior, and we talk a lot about uh, what's happening on the roads. But uh, I think what's important as corporates is, um, to not just look at a technology solution, but see really how we can use it to drive effectiveness uh, in terms of bringing down real events from happening. Uh, I think Netradyne for us has been uh, a success story. Um, we started off with a very small lot, uh, but we use significant numbers of them today and uh, probably with time to come, uh, will probably be one of the biggest users of these devices as we see uh, great benefits coming out to us. Uh, thank you. You have a nice evening, and I hope I was able to drive safely through this presentation. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Good evening. You know, it's absolutely fantastic to see a full house today because it looks slightly chaotic and undoable in the morning. But I'm uh, really thrilled that all of you are here and uh, you know you all took the effort and the time to make it. So thank you very, very much. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all once again uh, to uh, the Road Safety and Safer Mobility Forum on behalf of the Economic Times. My name is Meloni Bhatt. I'm the editor for Digital Broadcast. And uh, you know we're very thrilled to be able to spark this conversation because we do believe that uh, road safety is everyone's concern. And uh, you know uh, there's been a lot of references to technology, so it's fantastic to have uh, you know Durga here uh, to speak to us on um, uh, the next gen technology, uh, which is reshaping cargo and uh, vehicle safety. Uh, Durga, thank you so very much. Thank you, Meloni. And I'd again like to thank everybody in the audience. Uh, I just have one peeve. You know, everything that I wanted to say, 
has already been said. So I, you know, you stole my thunder, lightning, everything. So you that's know, my problem. You, but you'll have a lot of chances, you know, <laughs> uh, through the Q and A, you know. To but do. but thank you very much for a great discussion. I mean, you know, just fantastic to have this crowd here, as you said. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and and hear everyone's thoughts. I mean, a lot of interesting uh, points were made, and very good takeaways. Uh, but you know, it's time now for us to speak to you, and I want to. Uh, really start by focusing on, you know, what everyone's spoken about, and that is uh, road accidents in India, and India's abysmal and really sad uh, track record, you know, when it comes to it. And we've heard, uh, you know, all of the speakers reference to the fact that, you know, it is driver behavior, right? So be it, uh, you know, driving on the wrong side of the road, driving under the influence of, you know, perhaps not wearing seat belts or whatever. So. I think the first question really is that, you know, how do we use technology or any other model uh, to influence positive driver behavior? And, 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 and that's really uh, the crux of the issue, if you ask me, right? Um, and and there have been many philosophies around this. Uh, Ravi, during the, the first panel, mentioned ADAS, right, which is all about autonomous driving, which, um, which uses algorithms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, to impart automatic control to the vehicle, right? And you know, when our founded, founders started Netradyne, they did have the option of using the same technology that we use today, but focusing on autonomous vehicles. Unfortunately, as you know, all of us know, the promise of ADAS and autonomous vehicles uh, is still at least a decade to 15 years away from being commercially available, right? Uh, so we took the next best step, and we said that since the tech is available, right, why don't we impart it to the drivers to make better decisions, to take better driving decisions, and, you know, a, at least in the interim, make the roads a better place. Uh, we, and, and we are proud of the fact that um, the tech has worked, right? And uh, we've had customers, you know, you saw the writer's slide. We've, uh, the largest e-retailer uh, in the globe has actually publicly announced that after using our tech, their accident rates have dropped 40%, right? So uh, we found that inherently, if there is, uh, and there are two aspects here, right? There, one is uh, alerting the driver in real time right? And then it is taking corrective action to coach the driver and, you know, help improve positive reinforcement, right? And that happens in a secondary fashion. So in, in terms of enabling real-time alerts, we found that intuitively, you know, even if it's a beep, today we have uh, the ability to actually beep whenever there is an infraction, or if it's a serious infraction, you know, actually have a, have a sentence put on your seatbelt or, you know, please wake up, or please take a break, uh, stuff like that. We found that intuitively, whenever there is something in the cabin, over a period of time, the mind of the driver autocorrects itself so that that alert is reduced. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a lady who was part of a Fiki drive. Um, you know, Fiki organized this drive of uh, five women drivers to drive from the Waga border right down to Kanyakumari. And we just installed devices in their cars. We didn't tell them what it was going to do and why it was there. Uh, we didn't view any videos, nothing. It's just that the in-cab alerts were, uh, you know, enabled. At the end of the drive, I had a conversation with one of them, and she turned around and told me, you know, the first day I felt so irritated because this damn thing was beeping all the time. And I just wanted that beep to stop. By the second day, I figured out the pattern as to why it is beeping, right? And by the third day, I realized that if I drove in a particular manner, the beeping stopped, and that manner of driving was a safer way of driving. So, you know, the change in the driver intuitively happens with just that. And then if you add on the secondary part of it, which is about, you know, using video uh, to actually show um, what went wrong and what could possibly be corrected. 
And in our case, we've also introduced positive reinforcement. So we actually provide a positive uh, driving score if the driver takes a good behavioral decision, right? So that adds to his score. So when you put all of this together and, and if you gamify it, the results can actually be fairly, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say much more than effective and, and improve this whole uh, driving behavior issue that we're seeing. Uh, you know, and, and I completely agree with everybody. One air, airplane crash in our country causes huge, you know, noise. Right? If you really look at the stats, we're talking about two 737s crashing every day. And, and hopefully, you know, with, te with technology like ours, and if tech gets adopted more, we could potentially reduce that fairly significantly. You know, talk to us about uh, the adoption of it. You know, uh, where are you seeing it? What is, uh, uh, you know, how is it taking off in the India market? So the India market has actually been a positive surprise for us. Um, purely in terms of numbers, um, I think when COVID receded last year, um, in India we had about 600 vehicles deployed with our technology. Uh, we closed, uh, you know, December last year, I mean, in 22, with an order book of 5,000. So the growth and the adoption in the Indian market has been uh, much faster than we expected. Initially, you know, our, our thoughts were always that when people pay uh, for the value, but as everyone today spoke about, you know, the, 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 the cost of the tech is... Uh, insignificant when you actually compare it to the cost of, uh, you know, forget lives, but the, just the cost of an incident itself um, it drowns in, and, you know, dwarves um, the cost of tech. So that's been a huge positive uh, surprise for us. Where's the adoption coming from? It's largely, obviously, from the organized sector. Uh, we are yet to actually penetrate, uh, uh, you know, the, the consumer market. For example, we haven't extended the technology for individual cars as yet. Uh, it, we're still focusing on the commercial segment of the market, where uh, clearly there is a there is a business, you know, uh, return, uh, and, and people are seeing that very very clearly. So, if, as 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 you would have seen from speakers who come from uh, you know carriers of high value, hazardous hazardous. Uh, cargo, uh, precious cargo like cash. Uh, for all of these industries, it's become uh, a, a fairly no, a, fa a no-brainer, if you will. We are also seeing high adoption from employee carriers. You know, in India, there are lots of vans and 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 buses who transport employees, at, especially at night time, especially women employees. So that's become a huge uh, market as well for us. So. Uh, there is no single industry, if you will, mm. because its safety is a horizontal. But wherever the cargo or um, or the or the vehicle or obviously the driver is is considered precious, the applicability is there, and we're seeing that happen. You know, what are the challenges of implementing tech such as these uh, in consumer vehicles? So, uh, the challenge really is. There is no tech challenge, and I'll be honest with you. Um, so let, let me address that in two forms, right? One is the tech as it applies here in India, and the tech as it applies globally. Uh, at the global level, the tech is far more impactful because there, are, there is consistencies on the road, right? For example, road signs look the same all across the US, right, or, or any part of the world. Uh, traffic lights are fairly homogenous, right? That's not the case in India, right? Where in, in two streets next to each other could have different shape signs. So uh, for a machine to learn those inconsistencies is really hard, right? Um, and, and for the, the consumer, things like posted speed signs and their violations, you know, things like uh, how many times did I skip a traffic light? You know, those violations are all important. Now, those we, we just can't offer in India because of uh, the lack of consistency. What really works across the globe is, is, is 
everything to do with the driver, right? Uh, and that works for the consumer as much as it does for a commercial fleet. Uh, the needs of the consumers are a little different, though. Uh, in, within the commercial space, there is a fleet manager or there is a control room, right, which monitors infractions, takes corrective action, uh, provides preventive measures or coaching. That does not exist in the consumer market. So we are actually in the, in the process of figuring out how do we make it easier for the consumer to actually digest the information that the tech can give them, right? And once we have that, then the tech is applicable across the board. You know, someone mentioned that uh, accidents with two-wheelers are higher, you know, when you compare it with accidents, uh, you know, with, with other kinds of transport or whatever. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, can this tech be made applicable for the two-wheelers as well? To some degree. So, so here's the challenge, right? Um, you would have seen a slide which had the photograph of the device. So uh, basically, we operate with camera sensors, right? And we have one camera which looks outside the vehicle and one camera which looks inside the vehicle. Now, if I look at a two-wheeler, right, I need to be able to uh, have a device which can focus on the driver as much as it focuses on, on the road, right? Now, imagine a, a, a two-wheeler driver with a helmet, with a visor, uh, so the camera can't detect his face, right? So everything to do with distraction, uh, drowsiness, which is based on eye blink, yawning, all that goes away, right? So a large part of the effectiveness gets taken out. We've been brainstorming this for a while. I think the biggest value for a two-wheeler would be our ability to actually manage swerving, you know, and, and the swerving which causes dangerous driving could be one of the big areas which could be detected in addition to things like following distance or collision warning and things like that. But uh, the, the tech challenge really is to be able to monitor the driver. So that remains, you know, for, for the segment of, of the vehicles which actually contribute to perhaps the greatest there, number there of is a challenge. accidents. Yes. We still are struggling with... With yes, we are. All right. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the driver eye system, is that the, you know, tell us a little bit about how that actually works, you know, what sort of... Uh, sure. Goes so, into it. it's, um, you know, theoretically pretty simple, okay? And there are, there are three different areas of tech which contribute to this. Uh, one is the ability for the device to recognize objects and then recognize when an infringement related to that object has happened, right? For example, recognize that there is a vehicle in front of you, and then recognize after that that my position related to that vehicle is either too far or too close, right? That's the following distance, for example, right? Or, for example, if you take a posted speed sign which says 60 kilometers an hour, the machine needs to recognize that that is firstly a speed sign, mm -hmm. and then that 60 miles or 60 kilometers an hour is related to, you know, my vehicle, and it is 60, so therefore I need to monitor that. So that, this area is all about artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithms which teach, you know, just as you teach a child uh, that your name is Biloni, you know, when you hear it, Six times, seven times, ten times, it ingrains Repetition. in the child's brain. Similarly, we've got to do that with each of these objects. So one is the, the whole analytics piece. We call that the analytics piece. The second is the compute on the device, right? Uh, the device itself needs to be able to compute in real time all of these images which are being fed into it on an edge processor, right? Uh, so we have a processor which is capable of managing this video processing, right, on the device itself. And then finally, it's all about the presentation uh, to, say, the fleet manager or whoever is in charge of the control room, which happens through the transmission of a video to the cloud using uh, a user experience which is friendly, which is able to, you know, extract the data in a meaningful way for action to be taken. So there are three parts of the tech, and that's what the driver eye system fundamentally, you know, is made up of. So we have a device, uh, we have which, which then
captures all these events, uh, processes them, and then we have a cloud interface which allows the end user to actually see what's happening and take action. All right, and you know, uh, when it comes to kind of training the driver on it, you know, uh, what is the, the time that is required? You know, is there any formal training that is required? Or Absolutely, there is there is a formal training which is which is fairly simple, you know, which talks about what are the different parameters that the device is actually going to monitor, and by the way, there is a misunderstanding amongst a number of drivers that this is all about surveillance, right? This camera is not a surveillance camera, right? It only captures events which take place uh, as video clips of infractions, right? Uh, so uh, the messaging to the driver really is that this is not something to be scared of. It is something which can actually help you uh, drive better and be safer. Once that message comes, comes through, they embrace the technology fairly quickly. Um, in, incidentally, I, I was at um, uh, a petrol pump at uh, in Bangalore when one of the one of the tankers with our device pulled up. And I just went up to the driver and asked him, you know, ye kya karta hai? he actually came back with a very positive review. He said, Ki, you know, I can't drive without this being on because, you know, my life depends on it. So once they embrace it and understand it, it's, uh, it, it happens very quickly. The, the training for the drivers is in two parts. One is when they start using it, as the training is all about what it is and what it, what what to derive from it, right? The second part is actually the corrective behavior, right? Which is coaching to change behaviors. And there are two ways that that gets done. One is obviously through videos that the fleet manager actually uses. We also have a virtual co coaching mechanism, which uh, if the driver I uses, uh, if the driver uses the driver I app, which is part of our offering, you know, on a weekly basis, he or she would get uh, two or three videos of that particular driver which impacted their score. And, you know, automatically the driver just has to go through it and say, oh, okay, uh, if I had done this better, my score would have been better. So, uh, yeah, the training of the drivers is important. And, but more than training, it's the perception that this is a device which is not going to... Um, you know, show only the faults that I have is is the big shift that, that needs to happen. Yeah, uh, have you seen any sort of, I mean, I'm interested to know that, you know, uh, when it comes to the India market and, you know, versus, you know, other parts of the world, is there any sort of a shift, you know, have you come across any sort of a data point that kind of pops in India, you know, which, which perhaps does not uh, someplace else? So I'll be honest with you, Meloni, we haven't reached that level of scale yet, okay? Uh, in the US, for example, we have uh, about 170,000 devices on the road, right? In India, we're still nascent, we're still very, very new. Um, I think the, uh, the aha moment will probably happen as we get scale and as there is understanding broadly about uh, you know, when one fleet reduces accidents by 40%, uh, the impact is huge on that fleet, but it, you know, the impact on roads is lost, right? But then suddenly if you reach a scale of, say, 40,000, 50,000 devices on the road, and if they reduce accidents by 40%, then the aha moments will happen, right? And that's what we're actually gunning for. So are you seeing, uh, you know, uh, fleets in India, commercial vehicles, Oh, interested in adopting Oh, technology. absolutely. In fact, we were really surprised and, and the team is here and, you know, one day... Um, so normally the process that customers take is to use the device in a trial, uh, as you know, in a proof of concept, they go through what happens, uh, how, you know, um, how sh you know, how different alerts get reduced and so on. And, and that typical period is about three to four months uh, of evaluation which happens. We were pleasantly surprised when one week, um, you know, a customer just called, said that, look, I have spoken with 
uh, so and so who's using your technology. Uh, here is here is an initial order for a hundred devices, just on word of mouth, right? And just that week we got three POs um, with with just one telephone call. Uh, so I, I I believe and I think this audience will uh, will probably co uh, corroborate this, but I believe that the uh, uh, the experiential factor in India and and the sharing of that experience is very, very high, and people look to adopt what others have significantly done. And we're seeing that happen. So, you know, that was extremely encouraging for us. All right. You know, moving slightly broadly, uh, you know, in the, to the aspect of safety, uh, with the automotive uh, sector focusing on, you know, connected vehicles, how right. do you see all of that impacting safety? So, so as I said, uh, you know, every tech that you put in, to the vehicle has an impact, right? Uh, the ultimate impact will will obviously be when uh, vehicles, you know, use autonomous driving to the hilt. Uh, you know, I think Bayram mentioned in his in his talk that he would really like to see autonomous uh, automatic braking and and swerving, etc., come into India, um, and, and those will happen. Uh, the only question is how we actually put them together in a package which is easy for the consumer, or, or not really the consumer, but uh, the, the owner of the vehicle to actually use and consume. Uh, there are challenges, and the reason why autonomous driving is taking such a long time to become a reality is that imagine this, right? Uh, we are, at the end of the day, talking about a technology which is all about probability, right? Uh, we are very proud of the fact that you know, some of our alerts have, you know, up to a 98, 99% accuracy. But imagine if that, uh, and, and, and this is great because we're alerting the driver on a true incident 98, 99% of the time. But when you talk about a vehicle without a driver, that 1% or 2% doesn't become acceptable. Mm -hmm. Which means that two out of every 100 is going to result in a fatality could result in a fatality. Possibly, yeah. So so we have to use, we have to train the tech with data until the accuracy levels go up to say three nines, four nines, five nines, before you can actually trust that a car without a driver or a truck without a driver would make the road a safer place. Uh, you know, speaking a little bit about policy, for instance, uh, uh, the government is yet to implement the recommendations of, uh, you know, the Niti Aayog uh, of, uh, you know, in the three-year action agenda of the Niti Aayog and some of the recommendations uh, of uh, uh, the body were essentially, you know, standardize the reporting of accidents, you know, uh, create infrastructure pieces or, you know, where you are able to have ambulances in line, especially after an accident, make sure that, you know, we are able to get an accident victim to a hospital Absolutely. within the 10 minutes yeah. and, and stuff like that. Now, that's not implemented. So in the absence of that sort of a framework, you know, how do we manage uh, setting up of a framework, you know, eco the ecosystem manages to set up so some sort of a framework uh, where we either uh, reduce the number of accidents, you know, the tech piece being, uh, you know, one way to input into it, but also, you know, manage the fallout of accidents? Uh, and that's a great question, and I see this every day. I, I'm not sure how often you visit Bangalore, but every time I'm in, on the road in Bangalore and I hear an, amb an ambulance siren, my heart breaks because I know that, you know, it is going to take so much time. It literally takes 45 minutes in Bangalore to cover four kilometers, right? And that's just not acceptable. Uh, I think a couple of things would really, really help, right? One is basic understanding that if you have lane driving, right, and if you, if you follow lane driving rules which say that a slower vehicle is on the left side of the road, uh, you know, leave place for people to get around you if required, uh, if some level of enforcement could happen around fundamental behaviors in the road like that, we would be able to, you know, 
have situations like ambulances reach their destination much, much quicker. I, the issue now is that you know ambulances themselves, when they drive, are are so dangerous because they have to maneuver in and out of crazy traffic, uh, and and so the ability to reach a victim or a potential incident in ten minutes is is nigh impossible, right? And and then to get from there to a hospital is a is a sec is a separate story altogether. Uh, but yes, we do need to have regulations, you know, tech can only do that much, right? Tech can reduce um, the number of incidents that you have. Uh, it could potentially also reduce the severity of the incidents. But once the incident happens, then we have to depend on infrastructure in terms of, uh, and, you know, the civil, or, or the civic sense being driven in to follow fundamental rules so that uh, another life could potentially be saved when, when an incident does happen. Right, you know, and, and, and it is, you know, we, we talk about it in numbers, but, you know, actually there are stories, you know, behind every person oh, who absolutely. is an accident victim, you know, uh, uh, the, the Save Life, and this is my last, uh, you know, question, if you could input into that. Uh, the Save Life Foundation and the World Bank actually did a study, and I think we had some of the data points that emerge out of it that, uh, you know, for 1%, India has 1% of the vehicles of the world, and we have 11% 11 11 of, of fatalities. The yep. and, and fatalities, you know, you know, leading to deaths and disabilities and all that. Um, and, you know, there was another, there is another very striking point, actually, that emerged from the study, and that was uh, that uh, people from lower income households see double, more than double the number of deaths than people from uh, higher income households post crash. In India, and essentially, you know, the messaging is really simple, right? If you're poor, uh, you the know, there of are, this. there, it's two more times that you might, you know, possibility you might not survive. that you might not survive. Uh, you won't get help uh, in terms of, you know, hospital. You might slide into poverty. Out of it, pocket expenditure is really, really high, and also, you know, the fact that you might not be able to lawyer up, right? Like chase the tribunal yep. to, 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 to get uh, compensation. Uh, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, and, and India is, is not really a rich country, right? How do we ensure justice or how do we ensure that, you know, we are able to create some sort of a support? There is some policy, but you know, uh, the amount or whatever, in terms of, uh, you know, the industry and the stakeholders, any thoughts on that? Look. It's a complex problem, right? The problem exists, um, but I think it's, it is complex to solve, and it needs a number of different people and players to come together to actually put in um, a significant thrust uh, to make the situation improve. Having said that, you know, the fact that today, uh, you know, the leaders of this country have said that they do want to reduce road accidents. Uh, and I think the number which was stated was, uh, you know, bring them down by 50% by 2025. Now, the fact that there is recognition, right, itself is encouraging because in the past, even that did not exist, right? And as, uh, you know, as, as Pankaj said, just, you know, uh, the fact that you're, you're building roads, but if, if they're not really the right roads, then you're not saving lives anymore. So uh, the fact that there is recognition is, is encouraging. Um, what, what we would love to do is to be part of um, a serious fora which looks at different aspects. Tech is one aspect which, which we could bring to the table, but there is also the social aspect uh, in terms of, uh, you know, why should the poor not get equal treatment when, when the incident is the, is the same. So there's a social aspect. There is also an infrastructural aspect, right? And, and we would love to be a part of uh, an act active forum which uh, comes together to actually try and at least bring a trial or, or, a, or a POC in our language, right? To see what would work and what wouldn't work. But 
Um, but I think that's beyond just tech. We would love to be a part of that if it's possible. All right, you know, hopefully you'll be able to... Uh, Master support. And, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Vinodi. You know, for you, giving us all of these insights. Thank you all for being a wonderful thank you, and all attentive of you. Thank you, audience. all of you. Good evening, ladies and men. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Economic Times and Road Safety, uh, Netradine, for organizing this uh, Road Safety Forum. Uh, I, um, that's the boss he told, that's the additional charge given to me very uh, few days back only. Uh, I am with the World Economic Forum. Earlier I was with NHEI. Uh, Fast Tag was one of the program which I was uh, instrumental to implement. I was heading the company IHMCL, which implemented it. And I'm very enlightened with the kind of discussions I heard the experts who are here, how uh, AI-based things are doing. Let me uh, go back and tell you why I feel so happy about this. Uh, when I started the program, which I started with the uh, World Economic Forum, was uh, Road Safety 2.0. The name which I coined probably first time was the next generation road safety technology-driven road safety, that should be the uh, And when I see the next-gen solutions, so many companies coming up. I saw Intel, uh, Interdine is one. There are many. Uh, uh, I mean, I see there was an app. He was just showing me. Uh, I'll be just explaining about it. I see the ecosystem is building up. The people are coming up, a lot of startups, a lot of new companies, or bigger companies. Uh, coming up to the India, Netradine, one such big company. They're all now focusing to use technology into Indian uh, road safety ecosystem. And that's actually paying a lot of um, dividend. Uh, I will share some data which uh, very recently uh, I collected. I was sitting with uh, Niti Ayog when we were deliberating. Uh, there are two, two figures when you look at the uh, things. One, 2021 road accident figures has gone up by 20% over the COVID uh, time figures, uh, 2020. That you can always say because uh, more traffic has come on the road, so it has gone up because 1,33,000 people, though it's, uh, uh, there's no authenticity, there are multiple sources say different, uh, uh, many people say 173 lakh people died in 2021 as per the report. Uh, if you read the World Bank, some inside report, it says over 200,000 people died in the road accident. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is a serious issue. Uh, since the ecosystem is building up, the technology is one of the, um, you can say, is coming as a saver. As a United Nations, the road safety is a complex problem. The just now I was listening to him. It's a, it's a multi-layered complex problem. It's not only complex. The, if you look at the number of stakeholders involved, it's actually one of the most complex problems I find uh, implementing fast track, I was thinking a challenge, but this is much bigger challenge than that. Um, you got a number of stakeholders, the stakeholders' categories are different, the stakeholders' economic uh, strength is different, the policy makers, the, for example, say, you know, the national highways are made by the NHAI, which is a central agency and working under the central ministry more, but the enforcement of law and order on the national highway is a state subject. So the local police over there has to, so if any accident happens, then the, that comes under the local police. Most of the time, local police, uh, how they get, if I get what I did, I implemented PPP, uh, these uh, camera feeds. We call it ATMS on expressways. You were just mentioning um, on Eastern Peripheral Expressway. It passes into three states. Part comes into Haryana, part goes into UP, then again back to the Delhi. Any incident take place, it is recorded in the command center. Now this particular feed has to be sent to the Haryana police. Haryana police will ask a number of questions. Uh, this is the feed. I do not know when it was there. I suggested, uh, I was talking to DG Haryana police. I said, why don't you send a person who sits into the command center? The problem is with the police as well. Because, you know, the global standard of the police um, is generally per lakh 
there should be uh, 560 police. This is uh, usually globalist, and many developed countries has even higher. Scandinavian because of low post, they have 800 plus. US is approximately 555. In India, it is 140. So we are one fourth of the uh, police strength. So densely populated law. I mean, many law and order issues. How do you expect that police got only this job to look at the violations and keep challenging the people, asking them? That's practically impossible. So here, technology has to come. So based on all these things, what I uh, came to the conclusion, if we uh, do three things, which I term it a very small word, uh, three word, I mean, there should be smart road, which is full of the cameras, it should be network, there should be command center, which is capturing the violations. Uh, the roads are smart. There should be, uh, somebody just mentioned, um, there was, <clears throat> for example, uh, the dividers are bad. Uh, dividers uh, are one of the reason for a lot of accident and severe fatalities and the severe accidents. So smart roads, uh, well designed, properly, well connected, uh, with the technology enabled. Intelligent vehicles, the vehicles, what you guys are doing. You are making the vehicle smarter. The vehicle automatically have a, uh, detect the collision prevention should be there. These things, and finally the alert drivers, which again, uh, I see your uh, device is doing. And um, uh, similar pilot we did. So if these things are put together, but ultimately, it is informed to the driver because you make a road 100% safe, absolute engineering marvel without any black spot or anything. Uh, make a vehicle which is full of six bags and completely safe seat belts and everything. But give it to a driver who is less qualified, who is semi-skilled, uh, what is going to happen? He will make accident, he will kill the people, he may be saved because the airbags will open and he will be happy, but ultimately the uh, co-passengers, the people traveling on the road, it's a shared speed, they will be killed. And that's what exactly is happening in India. The fatalities, the death rate of the two-wheelers, the pedestrian is nearly 68%. Two-thirds of the people are dying of these. And the balance one-third, again you will see the smaller vehicle, uh, the people are dying more, barring of course. So there has to be uh, some uh, uh, solution which is Indianized, just copying, pasting the Western solutions over in here and implementing in that spirit probably may not work. Uh, but I'm absolutely, uh, very happy that the slowly ecosystem is building up. Yesterday I was in the ministry. Uh, I was uh, discussing about this, somebody, uh, uh, Pankaj uh, said that uh, very valid point, why don't we create a pull factor? So the safe driving score, from World Economic Forum, we did four pilots in the road safety using the technology. First pilot was same, safe driving score. There was a mobile app manufacturer who used to uh, start up, who was uh, having similar app. So we, from Economic Forum, said that you improve all these things. And uh, it was very low cost solution. The simple mobile camera was looking at the eyes in the same fashion this. And the scores were created. Uh, I gave the name it as a safe driving score. And the, uh, it was a pilot was done on some 10,000 drivers over a six month time. Uh, they drove something uh, roughly around, I believe 20 million kilometers in those six months. Uh, same way what uh, he said, the technology works, which is uh, uh, again and again proven literally zero accident. Uh, I mean, fatality was zero, four, five accidents, minor accidents were there. So that proved that, yes, if you monitor somebody, uh, <clears throat> accident can be prevented. Another, the safe driving score, how we said, the drivers were reluctant. Uh, they, they were switching off. Then we started that once you drive, per kilometer of running, you score, uh, you get, say, one point per kilometer if you drive safe within the... Um, normal speed which is prescribed and taking the frequent journey break which is uh, required as per the law. Uh, but if you over speed, the points are first them alert and points are deducted. Similarly, if you uh, do not take the break, points are uh, negative, minus points are there. Same way the AI can identify why you're, if you drove 100 kilometer, ideally it should be 100 points. But if it is less than that, that means some compromises were there. Those can be pointed out and told to the driver that these are the things which has been noted. 
we try to incentivize, and uh, I was listening to the uh, Mr. Bala about the insurance company. I personally went with the complete data seat to the IADI, and I'm very thankful to the new IADI chairman. He gave a good present hearing, and in fact, he said that we'll be changing this rule. What I was proposing them to make this a popular concept that safe driving score should be mandatory for all the drivers. What right now we are doing in India, the driving license once given or acquired or, I mean, you guys know better than me how somebody gets the driving license. Uh, when minister himself says a lot of um, driving license are uh, dubious, they're doubtful. So, uh, and that's not the end of the journey. The person has to be constantly alert. Uh, you see the protocols followed by the railway drivers. When the railway ha driver has to um, uh, drive a train, he is given one day rest by the department, a vehicle goes to him, brings him here, he is in a full um, uh, proper mind alert is there. You see the Air Force pilots, they are all given due course uh, proper rest. It is even seen that they haven't had the family, I mean, uh, if there is some problem, he fought with the wife or some spouse, probably he may not be in that good mood to drive the uh, aircraft because the people's uh, life is at risk. So why these things has to be checked. The driver, when he is in charge of the vehicle, he, uh, so many lives, uh, if it is a public transport, people or in the shared space, many people are at the danger because of him. He's uh, on EP, one example I will share with you when I was attending, we did a speed, uh, implement, implemented a speed radar to check what is the general speed people are driving. Yes, can you imagine what could have been the maximum speed which we recorded on that? It was 295 kilometer. I mean, so the, the EP is not a, a sports um, I mean, track. Neither the vehicles are meant for that. It was some, of course, high-end car. Uh, and, uh, and there were many vehicles, almost, I will say, more than, it was only one month pilot and 500 vehicles we could record which were driving their top speed was more than 200 kilometers. Around 53 vehicles, more than 250 kilometers. So the driver which is moving at this speed on a normal expressway or highway, they are basically the bomb, human bomb. The moment they collide with anybody, they themselves are in danger, but they are going to kill many people as well. So these things has to be checked in the driver behavior. So we wanted to say that driving behavior, this is score, SDS, is an indicator of driver behavior over a long period of time. This should be uh, tagged with these uh, driving license, and it should be shown in the Sarthi database. In a public domain, he is a driver, is the driver school is this. And what you said absolutely makes sense. It will give an, an additional opening uh, that if I want to uh, send my luggage from Delhi to Mumbai, uh, right now we look only for two things. What is the fare and what is the, how much time is going to take. Third thing, if I know that he's a good driver, he may charge 2,000 more, but I should be assured his points are very high. So that can be uh, another thing. So that's, and this probably, I, yesterday I was in ministry, which I was, why I was telling it, I gave them that this advisory can be issued. Let's not make a law because the uh, uh, system is evolving, but advisory can be given to the commercial way, and I'm very happy to share with the audience that uh, ministry is very serious on this. They asked me only you uh, draft a note and send us and let us uh, put to a committee and we'll be definitely. So very soon we may get an advisory where safe driving is score for the um, uh, commercial vehicles may be a mandatory requirement and it should be put on the portal. Uh, second thing which we did, we did a pilot, again very successful pilot was uh, the school zone. Uh, somebody was mentioning very rightly that the culture change has to come. Uh, in the school zone, we initially targeted the, some um, school safety awareness program with the children. But while doing this, a very interesting uh, fact, uh, if I'm taking more time, I may be reminded, I just want to uh, discuss my heart you know, about this road safety. So uh, when we started going to the school, uh, uh, 3M was doing this, as a, uh, it was a program uh, we had been encouraging from World Economic Forum. Uh, what happened? 
uh, we saw that the school zone, I mean, we are teaching the uh, child that uh, there should be zebra crossing, there should be, the, but the moment he comes out of the school, that itself is the most dangerous area. And um, 10 to 12 percent fatalities of the children takes place. In the, uh, so we said, let's improve the school zone. That's uh, another idea came to us. And I'm very happy that I, with IRF, I'm a road, uh, road safety ambassador with uh, International Road Redress and IRF. With them, we decided, launched a portal. At, on that portal, the school zone are audited. We got around 15 lakh schools in the country, registered schools. Uh, what we are trying to do, that we, uh, every school zone, in due course of time, will be audited uh, with respect to the IRC specification, what should be the, uh, whether the light is there or no, whether the zebra crossing is there or no, there is a uh, area for the children to come out of the school and wait for the bus and all this should, is there or no. Uh, and report this, uh, convert these things into a easily understandable uh, scorecard of thing. Uh, if the score is above 80%, Okay, the school zone is safe, give a red color on the portal, uh, green color on the portal. If it is between 60 to 80, uh, give an umber, uh, some, uh, it's a moderate uh, severity is there, a compromise is there. If between 40 to 60, it's a, um, a little serious. And below 40 is unsafe, declare. Let this portal be in a public view. It's uh, on IRF portal. And uh, so the parents, the citizens can see uh, what is the state of school where the children are studying, how safe and the pressure can be exerted. At least if we can improve the school zone, probably the child who is coming out of the school, he is habitual, he is daily looking at the good thing and he will ask the same thing uh, at the other places also. That here you are changing the culture from the beginning. And after five, six, seven years, he becomes a uh, young citizen and he is uh, going for a driving license. He knows from the beginning, he has seen all those things. And then we expect that there is going to be change. Third pilot was the PPP model of the uh, uh, doing the uh, enforcement, which is already going that PPP model, why I say because I witnessed it myself. At NHAI, we implemented ATMS system at many highways, but who watches the feed? Uh, I mean, this is a, uh, basically, I call it it's a kind of a, a wasteful expenditure as of now. Maybe later on it can be. So if you put it on PPP model, at least there is an expert agency which is at least ensuring, looking at the violations and telling to the police or some action is taken. And last was the emergency care where uh, uh, we, um, Highway Delight was one of the com uh, company which did it. Uh, we gave them find out some easy solution where in case emergency accident takes place, uh, somehow things, though we got 1033, the number which I only implemented, but uh, uh, still that location of the accident victim is not known. People call it the toll plaza and the, by the time vehicle reaches there, the, the ambulance, uh, mostly, I mean, uh, uh, that's uh, people become very serious or uh, a person who can, could have been saved if the ambulance uh, reached in time, uh, they generally lose life. So uh, here we said find out some easy, quick solution considering the ecosystem uh, which we follow in India. So they developed a very good QR code, code based device, probably he was just showing me. Uh, it, it is a fits on a vehicle. Anybody scans the QR code uh, on a vehicle uh, as a good Samaritan. If you see a vehicle is, uh, um, uh, I mean, some accident has taken place, just scan it. The message goes to the police automatically in a masked way. It goes with the uh, next of the kin, the family members, uh, and a hospital nearby, which has been mapped on the app and emergency care and the con connect uh, gets. So these are the technology interventions which are now taking place and I'm very hopeful that uh, considering the uh, ecosystem, the way it is developing, uh, one thing very good about the Indian system is we may be slow started, but when we start, we and technology we adopt very fast. UPI is a, a brilliant success, fast track, another success. Many technology-driven programs has been very, very successful. So if we merge technology and road safety, I'm sure in maybe come two to three years, we will definitely achieve the target which uh, Honorable Minister keeps on saying 50% reduction in the uh, road fatalities. Uh, that looks to me quite possible. 
Um, then, yeah, I won't be taking much time. I know uh, it's already um, uh, waiting for the dinner. But uh, any questions or any insight you want to uh, ask me, I'm uh, available over here. Yeah. One Thank you. Part. Fifty odd children die every day, right? And most of them are not from these schools. They are from the schools which are unregulated or maybe uh, they don't have uh, uh, the facilities that DPS and the other uh, schools will have. So, how do we address that? Uh, because that's a bigger challenge, in my opinion. No, no, thank you, Munkeji. Uh, Absolutely, that's what I, I was saying. We are not restricting to uh, uh, any particular school or DPS or uh, Army Public School or anything. What, what we are planning is the portal was uh, very recently, it has been launched. Uh, to, there are 15 lakh schools, I said. Our aim is by 2025, capture all the schools, at least show it on the portal. This is the vulnerability of the school. This school is how safe it is in a very simplistic, plain manner, like safe driving score tells you uh, that this driver, what is quality. For example, you see the Air Force, I mean, uh, aircraft pilots, they say he's a pilot of 1,500 uh, hours of flying. Uh, then we feel comfortably as yeah, a, a seasoned pilot. Uh, similarly, um, why, as SDS is creating ranking among the drivers, a concept which I'm uh, promoting, and of course, everybody is uh, echoing this uh, in the talk I can see. Same way, when the school are visible, on a public portal, the school zone, what is the school, uh, people are going to put, uh, put pressure. The parents who are going to put, uh, take admission, I mean, um, uh, with some caveat uh, at the rural, what will happen, but of course, this will reach over there also. The parent can ask, okay, your school may be very good, but the uh, road safety, it sees red, I can't take risk to put my child over here. So if such kind of pressure comes, then ecosystem starts moving. People start thinking, and uh, that's the only way. And the child, if he wants to actually learn, he has to see himself. And he, will, uh, he or she will definitely look subsequently in that way. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, my question is that uh, there is, uh, like, we see solutions like FastTag, then there is Natadyne solutions. So all these solutions, they also record metadata like uh, the speed and uh, like the GPS positions. So can these these metadata be utilized uh, on a micro level through analytics, AI, ML, uh, to, you know, uh, generate insights? As in, like, for example, if a uh, vehicle is traveling mm -hmm. at higher speed in a road that does not support it. So these insights, can they be used and leveraged further to, uh, you know, reduce the fatalities that happen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in fact, FastTag doesn't do the um, tagging of the, I mean, uh, tracking of the vehicle. Oh. Uh, it's used for the tolling. But of course, it gives you uh, increment. I mean, uh, if a vehicle has crossed toll A, you know it was, uh, next is B, so it is in between somewhere. That gives an approximation. But their solution does, yes. Uh, their solution is continuously tracking, it's uh, giving an alert, they're converting in a score also, it's uh, preventing the collision, there are many things. Not only, I will, uh, another very interesting, I was in a uh, few months back in uh, London, there um, uh, a similar kind of telematic solution they have developed, where, um, I mean, that's uh, different from your question, but I'm just, uh, how these uh, data can be helpful. Uh, there, uh, a, ca a case was filed by somebody that I had been uh, wrongly hit by this vehicle. And this vehicle should pay huge penalties and uh, millions of uh, um, pounds. Uh, they had put this telematic solution into the vehicle. Uh, and that this uh, telematic solution, uh, the camera was capturing the driving uh, front and inside camera both. 
there was no fault of the driver. The moment of ex uh, the moment accident took place, this uh, the video is immediately transport. I mean, it is uh, sent to the cloud so that it cannot be tampered. That came as a help. Otherwise, uh, uh, this law is more or less same. Uh, what uh, Ravi was saying, it's uh, everywhere. It's uh, similar. Uh, the, the, this lady could have been asked to pay huge money, probably by selling her house and all. Uh, millions of pounds, but then these technologies help you. Not only the prevention of accident, but uh, false fabrication or the charges, etc., as well. And that's already they're doing. Uh, the technologies are doing. Yes. Just a follow-up question. Uh, of course, the uh, FastTag's uh, original device does not, but uh, there is FastTag's application also. So that uh, isn't the uh, location permissions um, available in that. Location tracking permission? No, it's a passive RFID. So it activates when it comes near a RFID reader. And that RFID reader is uh, placed at discrete locations at Toll Plaza. I meant the app. The application can also track no, locations, no, right? No, no, it, it cannot. Okay, okay. It cannot because it's not a GPS device. Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. Driving. Absolutely. I fully agree with you. You see the Australia, you see the Canada, US. It is one of the highest paid draw. In fact, the drivers there are earning $150,000 in a year which is almost one and a half times of the salary of a normal engineer, software engineer in uh, Canada and US, uh, same way in Australia. So there has to be, yes, I fully agree. <laughs> That's all. Thank you for supporting. Second point, sir. Uh, I have only three points. Uh, yeah. Second point is, uh, it is mandated that every uh, three months, every quarter or every six months, there is a fitness for the vehicle, a commercial vehicle. Commercial vehicle. vehicle. With a commercial vehicle fitness, gaadi ka hai, why not fitness of a driver also? Yeah, that that's what I'm saying. Mandatory. Why to three months? Let it to be the SDS. It's a yeah. real time. Yeah. You complete a journey, the, the moment switched off, your score is on the cloud. So uh, now the latest score is this. So fitness of a vehicle should also be married to the fitness of the driver. Absolutely. Yeah, fully so appreciate Since you are in the place where you can connect this. I no, no, I mean, this, uh, this uh, policy on SDS advisory, not a policy, it will very soon, it will be there. I fully appreciate And third is the complaint. Is the? See, complaint. Complaint. I mean, it's for the four. <coughs> what is being ignored, which is a, has a beautiful potential to be exploited, is me and my people who are 24 by 7 on the roads. Yeah. If you see, there was not a single mention of taking our help or our expertise, our people being trained. Because we are the first ones to be reaching the site of the accident, even before the police come. Absolutely. So that is where we would like, as Maple Highways, also to love to partner with anybody and everybody who would help us. In, you know, today, every three minutes a person dies. If we can make it to three and a half minutes, Look at the number of people can be. So that is where very, very that is extremely point. important that the concessioners are also taken on board and sensitized and ensured that they are also a performing part of the whole safety. Perfectly, environment. perfectly. This I will definitely convey this. That's a very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. One final suggestion. Yeah, yeah, please, please. policy call of mandating, because they cannot mandate in my car, but they can mandate a police vehicle or a government vehicle or a polit politician's or a minister's vehicle, right? So why don't they mandate, you know, putting up this kind of device like Netradale in such vehicles, the moment they become, you know, little more responsible, I'm sure we'll see a big change 
on the ground. So I can't comment on police. That's beyond my jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it is coming up in the uh, uh, your state transport buses. Uh, I was uh, in Hyderabad uh, for some meeting. We had a meeting with Chief Secretary and the Transport Secretary. Uh, they are very keen, and very soon uh, I think they will be issuing some RFP tender because there are many players, so the process they will be following. Uh, and they will install this kind of system in all the state transport buses. Uh, that's the uh, way the things. And subsequently, I'm sure police will also come. Since you are closer to the you know, policy makers, I think. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, these people have already started, the uh, state transport buses. Maybe, uh, of course, police will automatically uh, definitely come. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. I, yeah. Uh, just a feedback and a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, when I was a student, maybe 40 years back, there used to be a, a sort of a subject for RSP, road safety patrol. And uh, I, my, I myself was a student of RSP, and we used to manage the traffic at the schools. But I have seen that over a period of time, nowadays, this is not even offered as a uh, subject, as an optional subject in any of the schools. And I think it's very important that you also rightly said that catching them young is the key to win this game. And uh, why don't government or the uh, implementation agencies actually look at it as a mandatory requirement that every school student should have RSP as a uh, curriculum and which should be made mandatory? Yeah, so uh, just to, uh, I mean, putting it as a separate course, I do not know how interesting it will be, how beneficial it to the children, considering the very competitive ecosystem everybody is living. But what we did, uh, um, based on various studies, we recommended uh, some chapter into the uh, school children curriculum, which has been now accepted. Uh, most probably from the next academic session, you will find the, the small school children up to class fifth are reading about the road safety in some of the social subjects. Uh, it will be a, a chapter on which exams will also be there. Another interesting thing I will just share, uh, since you raised a point. Uh, I, we did a survey with, uh, mm, I mean, uh, this was done by BCG. Uh, in this survey, we find out how many drivers, how they get the drivers. You'll be surprised. Uh, one third of the driver never went to any school. They learned from, uh, in fact, uh, two third. Two third of driver learned from their parents, friends, or somebody. In fact, uh, I think uh, we all agree we went with some uh, friend or elder brother or and while coming back, he said, now you switch the seat, and you are the driver. So this is how people has learned. The driver of the commercial vehicle, he was a helper. Now, after back and forth, uh, he got license, and now he's driving. He haven't learned much about these things. So we did, and what we tried to do, why to solve this problem, uh, we started targeting the younger people. You know, every year, uh, 95 lakh youth become eligible for driving license because population is 140 uh, crore. So every year, nearly so many people attain the age of 18 years, they become eligible to be a driver. So we said, let's target these people only. At least they should be the first people who can be targeted. In five to seven years, they will bring the change in the ecosystem and very, very positive response. The youngsters were absolutely, uh, we, they have to be just guided uh, that you go to this school, here are the adults, you take this, and it works very well. Thank you. Hi. My name is Tejal Tyagi, and I, my question, I think more we discuss a lot on driver and the vehicle uh, part of which is which are the many important pillar of the road safety overall. True. I think uh, the journey part is also something which we need to think about because when we think about journey, the information to the driver on the black spots, whatever you call, or the risk on the road. Especially if I'm not from that particular area and I'm driving there and one part of the road is suddenly closed and all traffic is moved on to the half of the road, right? So all such risk, can we have some technology platform which is available for common public? Right, right now we use Google Maps which gives us some information. Yeah. Yeah. Some, and it's very, very, it's not sufficient to take any right decisions, keeping in mind safety uh, of our, our, ourselves and our family. Right, so uh, I, um, is, is, it, is, it, is there any opportunity where yeah, we can Yeah, thank have you, thank you very much. You asked a very, very relevant question. In fact, we are working on it. Uh, very recently, uh, we, uh, uh, I mean, uh, was discussing in the ministry 
uh, where we are proposing a super app kind of thing, where all the integrated discrete platforms like Vahan database, where the vehicle registration details are there, Sarthi database, where driver license are there, uh, the emergency care, all these get integrated on a single app. Uh, that is a super app, something like uh, Covin app, uh, where, which is the one-stop solution for all uh, immunization thing, similar kind of thing, where it gives the real-time information about the road audit also. If somebody takes a snap and uploads, uh, it is a pothole, it is uploaded and a uh, user can have a look at that. Uh, what is the status of that? Um, I mean, what you are asking, same question. And that connects the even hospitals and everything. If accident take place, the nearest hospital can be contacted immediately. Those things are already coming up. Yeah, Thanks, uh, yeah. just to add to that, sir, I mean, as a part of your own uh, pilot, uh, you have been a side, pilot yes. uh, we have added uh, all the black spot as API, open API, listed on a Bosch marketplace platform. So anybody building a mobility app can freely access the black spot API and also uh, can also connect us. I mean, we can, we are happy to share that black spot database. Uh, which is uh, technically integrated. Uh, Rajesh, in you must, uh, yeah. at least uh, to the audience sitting here, they should be aware about your things. You can discuss with them yeah, at dinner. I mean, just to, I will not take much time. I know we are running uh, very late. Uh, I'm Rajesh, founder of Highway Delight. Highway Delight, and we are a mobility platform services, and uh, we are very keen to uh, also parallelly work. From the day one, we have listed accident zones on the highways on our app. And uh, uh, it's been six years, and uh, we also, as Sir mentioned, about the road safety pilots, uh, we are doing two things. One is the QR code, uh, which can be pasted on the vehicle where uh, any vehicle unattended can be called, and also any vehicle met with an accident can be called uh, for the emergency. And the second project was on the Black Spot API, so we have already made it live. Uh, I <laughs> forgot to update you, Sir, on that. So, Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, sir. I have one uh, last question. Uh, everyone is explaining about driver issue, driver lapses, but actual uh, many might be percentage is less. There might be a accident happening because of some mechanical tanker leakage issues or it's fitness we are telling. Fitness but of the vehicle. Vehicle, but on road, suppose like corrosive liquids are going. Their tankers are also painted very well normally, but they are not painted at the standards what required. That all standards are on the paper, but who is following? That is also one of the important, how recovery, because we are, as a India, we are aiming for green energy also. When such accidents happen, all it get into the environment also. So recovery point, and as well as some norms for this kind of audit is there to on road. And with this tech support guys also we can see Yes, this tanker is on the road, which is made on that standards, and it is running. So are we planning such thing, or we can have such No, definitely future? you gave a suggestion. Uh, we'll look into, I mean, it should be. Uh, see, when the super app comes, what he has developed comes into, uh, all these was actually, ultimately, uh, what Pankaj was saying very rightly, that pull factor has to be created, and involvement of every citizen. It's not only police job, uh, it's a citizen's job. Everybody has to be conscious to ensure that road safety is a very, very complex issue. At least next uh, one decade, I believe, one and a half decade, uh, it will be, uh, slowly it will taper down. And probably after that, you drive in the US or any developed country, uh, at the midnight also people will stop at the where a stop sign is there, uh, even for a few seconds and then they move. Uh, here, we do not follow even in daytime the red light. And the same person, if I am driving there in US, I will be following all the rules. The moment I land in India, I become la la land or do anything. So that culture will slowly come. I fully agree. I mean, people have to report, do yeah. pair policing among each other. And As a my company, I would like to contribute in Good, that vertical. I most need support from um, all the industry. Ah, most welcome. You. you can approach me, write to me. Sorry, sorry to hold. This only one, I'll take only 30 seconds. Yeah. I think we discussed so many things uh, on the safety part, and I play a very big role in my company in safety. Good. But one uh, very important thing, uh, what I can see, you know, half of our roads, or I will say 60, 70% of the roads, are occupied with parking. If you go to, for example, if you know the Godbandar Road, every day one accident happens on the slope there. Because of the containers overloaded, or somebody is carrying a overdimensioned uh, you know, truck. 
how do we solve this? Because this is all we are talking in this forum. But practically, you know, no, no, sir, practically uh, things how do we stop that? Yeah, uh, uh, well, what uh, is the way out? Yeah, absolutely. There are way out. Technology is the great, biggest enabler. Already it is being done. Uh, one thing is what uh, this app was doing, but there is a super app probably you know, it's called Park Plus. Uh, it is very popular in Delhi Gurgaon side, having some presence in some of the uh, metros. This app has got a feature. Uh, and this app, around 40 uh, lakh car, 4 million cars are already enrolled uh, on that super app. There is a feature into it. As you scan the QR code uh, for payment of the um, I mean, Paytm or anything, making payment, same way you can scan, you can take a photo and upload. The moment wrong park vehicle is there, like in, you said in Godbandar, you report it, this app will send it to the police control room immediately, and people are being challenged, they are being penalized. It's working very good in a pilot basis in some of the places. Soon, I'm sure, uh, as the way ecosystem is developing, more apps will come like this. Um, that is Park Plus, maybe Park Double Plus will come at Mumbai. You may find very uh, quickly some solution. Yeah? Thank you, uh, Lejimeh. Oh, okay. <laughs>